We are now recording. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, today is our joint meeting of Thursday, August 13th. Um, welcome, everyone. According to the Governor's Executive Order 7M, uh, this meeting is recorded. Um, so with that being said, uh, this is our call to order. Uh, Pete, we do not uh, require a quorum today, although I think we have one, um, uh, but we have nothing to vote on. So why don't we get right into uh, the development project updates. And again, just give us the clean and mean stuff that's pertinent, pertinent and uh, we'll take it from there. Sure, certainly. Um, let's see, I don't know if you've, if, you, if you've driven by the Masonic building uh, just in the last day or two, but um, the trees on the Church Street side of that building were heavily damaged by the storm. So you now have a uh, wide open view of that building on, um, from the church, church Street side of it. I did speak to the uh, owner of the property. Uh, we had tried to schedule uh, a meeting with him uh, some weeks ago. Uh, he did circle back. So I'll, Mark, I'll be uh, circling back with you to set up a time uh, to sit down with him. And um, there have been several interested parties in the building, but nothing has seemed to stick yet. So I think we, if we can just um, hear from him what some of the challenges uh, have been and see if we can come up with a strategy uh, to get that uh, property uh, back back in good use. Um, you may have seen the Comstock Ferry property uh, changed ownership. So Julia and Spiro are now the owners of the property. Um, I think I mentioned that at the last meeting. One of the things to be aware of is there was we had given them a facade grant uh, some years ago. There was still some money left on that uh, commitment. So we received a check for, I think, 14,000, uh, which we will be putting back into the facade program. So as part of that change of ownership, we did get uh, a reimbursement on the outstanding uh, facade loan. Uh, they are also pursuing um, a liquor permit with the Planning and Zoning Commission. They want um, permission to sell beer, wine, and liquor uh, as part of the new ownership plan. So uh, that's going to planning and zoning in September. Um, we had a, a couple of calls with the owner of 1000 Silas Dean Highway, uh, Mr. Funaro, uh, with a, a new interested uh, party. Um, we did uh, talk at length about um, some plans they have for the property. Uh, they were going to circle back with us, uh, but they have not done that yet. Uh, so we'll keep you posted uh, if that um, project has any um, has any legs. At the same time, I did give the owner a status report on the uh, self storage uh, moratorium and the self storage regulation, just so that they're in the loop. Um, believe it or not, we did. I did get an inquiry from a self another self storage developer since our last meeting. Uh, I explained to them the moratorium. Uh, I did try and connect them up with the. Uh, the owner of the property up on the Berlin Turnpike, uh, where we did approve a self storage facility. So I don't know if that uh, connection was made. But nevertheless, uh, there clearly is a market in Weathersfield for uh, self storage. So just uh, be aware of that. I did also speak with an interested party um, regarding the auction house on Church Street. I sent them some facade uh, information. Uh, I also sent them our tax incentive program information. I have not heard back from them, but nevertheless, there seems to be some interest uh, in that property, but nothing specific. And then um, we, issued a, we issued a demolition permit for the uh, Tilted Kilt building where the Chase Bank is going. Um, and you may have seen some equipment parked there. So that building uh, should be demolished in relatively uh, short order. Um, the only other thing is the nursing home property up on the uh, Jordan, Jordan Lane has been very quiet. Um, so there is nothing um, uh, pending uh, there. Be happy to answer any other questions uh, regarding some of the other properties in town. No, I, you know, it's, just a, it's just an interesting note to look at the demand signal coming around those self storage properties. And if you look at the number of for sale and sold signs here in town on residential properties, um, it, it, it looks like there's going to be a demand signal for a long time in the future, given that's one of the big, uh, big things that makes people want units is relos. 
Yeah, but I also saw some conflicting information in a New York Times article. I think um, that was from me. That was from you, right? So, yeah, it's it's an it's a it's you scratch your head, you know, in terms of of the, these kinds of things. Maybe they're they're planning it out, you know, multiple years down the road. So, any other thoughts from the group? Pete, just a Peter, how's the restaurant? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Peter, how's the restaurant coming up on the Berlin Turnpike? Uh, what you see is what you get, which isn't very much. So that's probably, I know we have reached out to him periodically to try and move that along. And uh, we have not been very successful with that. Um, but uh, thanks for bringing that up. It's maybe time to reconvene uh, a staff meeting and see what we can do to get, get that project uh, going somewhere. I don't have my notes in front of me on that. I know it came up in our pod meeting, Peter, um, from Steve uh, Laterula from the building department was trying to work with them on some stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to put my finger on it quickly to give you an update on it. Okay. Pete, uh, just a couple of things on um, Masonic and the liquor permit for Comstock. Um, and they're both, I guess, are kind of tied in. I think, Gary, uh, you guys were chatting with First Church on a potential parking opportunity. I don't know if, Gary, you wanted to just share something during Tom Manager's report, if you have anything, but that was just curious regarding that, especially regarding the Masonic. You know, the challenge has always been there is that if there's if anything that would have any traffic, it's always been a parking issue there. Um, and I just was curious if, uh, and if you want to hold off, Gary, if you have something to share, um, you can do that later on in, in your, in, in that meeting, but, um, and on the liquor permit, Pete, I mean, I know there's things regarding being close to churches and stuff. Is there anything in their permit that would be, there's some stuff grandfathered, obviously. You've got, uh, did La Noche apply for a uh, liquor permit yet? Okay. No. Um, and obviously I know Village serves uh, uh, beer um, and I think wine there, but is there any conflict or anything are they on that liquor permit for Comstock? Uh, it is it is a factor in the decision making for the planning and zoning commission in terms of proximity to churches and schools and daycares and things like that. So the commission will have to will have to weigh that. Uh, there's no um, unlike other towns, we don't have specific separation distance requirements. So some towns say you can't be within 1,500 feet of a church and those kinds of things. We do not have that um, specific regulation. However the commission does have to look at proximity to those kinds of things when they make when they make their decision so it will be it will be discussed uh but will ultimately be up to the commission to make that call okay great um you kind of touched on the self-storage already pete anything to add to that so um extension so the i did submit a um a, an application to extend the moratorium for another three months based on our last uh, meeting. That is scheduled to be heard on September 1st. The moratorium uh, expires September 5. So we're just coming in under the, under the radar. Um, at the same time, I, did su I, I haven't submitted it yet, but at, at next Tuesday night's um, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, I'm going to place the proposed regula regulation changes on the agenda for a pre-application discussion. We had originally tried to put that on the last meeting that got canceled. Um, I wanted to uh, go through the proposed changes with the commission. We have several new uh, commission members. So I didn't want to file an application and then find out that these new commission members members have uh, maybe a difference of opinion. So we're going to have a conversation before I file the actual regulation changes with the commission next Tuesday night. And then depending upon the feedback I get, I will submit a formal application uh, to amend the regulations to create the new, the new standards for self-storage facilities. So that's where we are in that scheme. Okay, great. Thanks, Pete. Uh, business outreach? So uh, we put that effort on hold, uh, given the, uh, the pandemic. Um, I think, uh, however, it's um, become uh, clear to us during this pandemic, we need to do a better job of communicating 
uh, with the business community. Uh, and that was the whole intent of that business outreach initiative. So I'd like to um, maybe uh, schedule a, a marketing meeting, maybe in the next couple of weeks and uh, get that going forward uh, as quickly as we can uh, after Labor Day. So um, that's, that's primarily the reason I put it on the agenda is let's, uh, let's get back to that and get that, um, get that underway. Um, the last, I think the last that I'm aware, I'm looking at my notes is that the, the letter and the whole concept, the envelope were at the printers. Did we ever get a final back from them that you approved? Uh, we did. Uh, it's kicking around here somewhere, but that's kind of why I want to dust everything off again and get, get it all laid out on the table. Uh, we had them hold off on the printing um, because of what was going on. And, um, but we do have the purchase order set up and it's ready to go whenever. So I want, I want us to look at it one more time in case there's been any kind of uh, changes we want to make. Sure. Deb, that would be something that whenever we hold that meeting, um, obviously we'd like to have you there if you can physically be with us at that meeting, that Zoom meeting. Well, as yeah, soon as we get that date. Um, be happy to. You know, like I, Mark, I was going to bring that up today, um, the business outreach, because my thoughts now are that things have kind of settled down a little bit, a little bit in the business community because they can have outside tables and stuff like that. But, you know, it's going to be winter soon. And so I'm thinking I was going to bring up that I think that we should have that meeting and get something on top of that. I'm just concerned about the winter months coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so about doing another uh, meeting out to the business community like we did a couple months ago. Yeah. I, you know, I just feel like, um, there needs to be a connection somehow, you know, um, they're struggling even time-wise. So, you know, uh, I don't know, there's little face-to-face -face right now in it, but right now I think it's settled down a little bit, but I do feel I've talked to several business owners and they're, they're getting a little antsy about the winter months coming up and, you know, the unknown with schools opening and what's going to happen with that um, because some states have shown there's little, you know, some more outbreaks once the, you know, they go back to school. So I don't know, we got to come up with something. I'm not sure what, but just some TLC, I guess. So I think that would be great. And sure. I'm happy to be at the other meeting. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, your input on that, on both of those meetings would be important, Deb. Um, anything else on the outreach, Pete? No, it's just that we'll, um, maybe before we um, convene today, we can pick a, uh, a meeting date. Yep. Steep. So uh, believe it or not, uh, given everything that's going on, the state has announced another it. round of funding uh, through the steep program. They've changed the um, they've changed the rules pretty substantially uh, this time around. Uh, in the past, you could apply for up to 500,000. Uh, they've lowered that number to 128,457 dollars or something like that. I'm not sure how they arrived at that number, but nevertheless, um, there's a big pot of money available. Uh, the deadline was originally um, tomorrow. They've pushed it out two weeks. Um, so the uh, town manager and I and the town engineer have been discussing uh, projects. Um, originally, we were talking about uh, the, the fire the fire department uh, headquarters parking lot needs a bunch of work it's um it's been on the um, capital improvement list but has not been funded um so we were thinking that while potentially we could do that maybe we could talk to the surrounding property owners and have a consolidation of all of the parking there um and make better and more efficient use of that parking. Um, so we did reach out to a bunch of the property owners there. There seemed to be general support for that. However, when we put together the budget numbers, um, that project starts to get into the neighborhood of $400,000. So uh, this round of funding for STEEP would not um, be able to uh, cover that. But nevertheless, we started a process of talking to the property owners, getting some consensus, getting some plans together so that maybe down the road, if a bigger pot of funding uh, became available, we could pursue that. So our second 
uh, backup uh, project. And we heard this um, in two recent, uh, through two recent planning and zoning projects, there are missing, uh, missing sidewalks, um, basically the area between where the Borden is, going down Mill Street, and then all the way down Middletown Avenue to where um, the ABC Burger uh, project was gonna be built. So we are looking at uh, coming up with a budget for what it would cost to uh, make an entire sidewalk system between um, in, in that general area of town. We've heard it from a bunch of property owners as well recently. So that, that seems to be potentially the project that we would um, pursue funding for. It also supports economic development as well as improves you know, walkability and, and, and some of those other criteria that the grant program uh, is looking for. Um, so that's kind of where, we, where we're at with that project. We're still working on it, but nevertheless, that, that seems to be the project we may pursue for funding. And uh, when is the application period end for STEEP? Uh, two weeks. So um, is it a fairly, I mean, obviously we're gonna ask for 128,700 and whatever dollars um, is, okay. We also have to come up with some matching funds. So we'll have to discuss, we do have, um, we do have a sidewalk uh, uh, line items in the town budget. Uh, we haven't confirmed uh, whether we can use that or not. The other issue we're still waiting to hear about, and maybe Gary can chime in on this, is that because we have uh, outstanding steep projects, um, we may uh, have challenges with this application. Uh, so we have the outstanding uh, money for the uh, Weight Watchers building, $200,000 that we haven't spent, uh, but there are other there's another project that I don't think we've closed out yet. Um, so we're waiting to hear whether that would um, preclude us from submitting a, a new application. Gary, if you wanted to chime in, uh, if you know anything more than that. Nope, that was actually a pretty good summary. There's, there's, two, um, there's two potential open uh, projects that in theory should be closed out. One of them is really in the state's hands. In other words, we've provided them all of the information, we'll just turn over at the state level and the kind of a understanding of what was included in the in the backup document and what wasn't there, we're still kind of trying to work that out. Um, and frankly, working it out with someone who's um, on a rotation um, simply because they're not in the other state's not in the office right now has proven to be a little bit challenging um, because we can scan and send them stuff, but it's harder for them to kind of go through. You're, you're looking at backup invoices. I think that one will be settled without issue. Um, the other one is probably a little bit more of a, a hurdle, but um, I'm working with the OPM undersecretary to see if we can maybe get a pass. Um, so we're, we're gonna try. Um, I'm hoping in the next few days, I'll have a, an actual response that uh, gives us a green light. But it just reinforces the need for us to do something with that $200,000 for the Weight Watchers building. Um, so that we're not in this position uh, going forward into, into the future. We are able to reallocate that if, if we need to, correct? So, I mean, I know we've got some, you know, movement, if you will, at 1000 Salestine at Weight Watchers, but if, you know, as you said, what we're trying to do is exhaust everything we possibly can as an agency to help that owner and developer, but if that doesn't come to fruition, are we able to take that 200,000 and just put it back into our steep program? How does that work, Pete? Or what are the risks on that? There, there is a process that we can uh, pursue to reallocate that for another project. Um, we would have to put together a plan and supporting documentation that explains you know, how it would be used. Um, so we're not precluded from using it. We just have to go through a process and a justification. For example, if um, you know the nursing home on Jordan Lane had a developer and there was demolition, I think that would be probably an easy switch over because um, we'd be using it for the same uh, purposes, just on a different property. Uh, if we were to ask to put it in the facade program, I'm not sure how that would be received, but I think if we were putting it to a specific project, there was a specific plan in place for the project 
um, and there was going to be, you know, significant benefits to the community, I, I think we would be um, justified in, in doing that. Are we in any jeopardy of losing that money if we don't use it? I've always said we're always in jeopardy the longer it sits there, you know, that the state could go in there and sweep, sweep up the funds and put it towards the overall steep program. They have not really uh, threatened us with that. But as I say, um, given the times we're in, I think uh, it uh, behooves us to seriously consider uh, expending that money or, or putting it to another real project. Peter, don't we have preliminary approval to move that money from Weight Watchers back into facade loan program? Because no, of the fact that we had done that, you know, we'd done a duel with that before. No, we never really um, requested that. It, you know, they, they said you could reallocate it, but, but once again, it's dependent upon the project and the justification for it. Um, so, uh, but no, we, there's no, no preliminary approval uh, in any official way. Just, just some conversations about being able to go through a process to do that. Okay, um, salute to business. So this is the time of year where we start uh, planning for our December uh, salute to business. Um, obviously, this is a different year than we've ever really faced before. Uh, I don't have any confidence that by December 9th, we're going to be able to hold a normal, you know, salute to business as we've done in the past with 150 people, you know, at the country club. So I wanted to start a conversation about any ideas that people have about, you know, going forward with that event um, or, or rescheduling it or changing it, or I just wanted to start that conversation so that we could plan uh, accordingly. Usually at, at the September meeting, we actually start selecting winners and who we're going to recognize and, and all those kinds of details. So um, it'll be on us before we know it. So I wanted to put it on the agenda and kind of open it up for discussion. Peter, this is Judy. Hey, Judy. Uh -oh. Um, I, I definitely think we should be picking the winners um, and how we recognize them may change, but um, what is the policy at the um, country club right now? Are they having dining? And I assume it's like 50% or 25%. Yeah, we haven't uh, circled back with them specifically to um, understand what limitations they're presently facing. But those can also change, you know, in the next um, few months as well. So, um, yeah. but yeah, we can certainly reach out and find out where they are now and uh, go from there. I, I think there might be a 25 person limit based on the governor's uh, executive order. Yeah. Uh, clearly, um, so, you know, that, wouldn't even, so, that wouldn't even cover the winners. So, yeah. But I think that uh, if they were allowed to send one representative and maybe do it on a much smaller scale, but I do think we ought to pick the winners first. Um, but uh, I think that they should be recognized somehow. Um, if it's not there, then maybe <clears throat> another facility that could have a few more people. But if they could have one person come and just receive a plaque or whatever, or whatever we usually give them. I think the problem is the EDIC themselves would probably put you close to the limit. Well, we don't all have to be there. We don't all have to be there. Um, you know, it can be videotaped and, and shown. Uh, on, we could Zoom. Uh, we could do a Zoom. We could. We could. We could. Um, so I think that we should go ahead in September in choosing the winners as a beginning step. How many sure. businesses get recognized for that? I forgot. It varies uh, from year to year, depending on what's happened. And um, so, um, yeah, there's no, there's no hard limit on how many. It's just a matter of, you know, who, who was, uh, who's worthy of the recognition from the past year. You no, know, the chamber did uh, the best of, and we could not have our our um, 
you know, our event either. And we did a video of all the award winners. We, of course, that's why I asked how many, because little labor intensive, you know, we went and uh, videoed them getting their reward award and let them say something. And then we put it online, but just a suggestion if we can't do anything. Okay. That's a good idea. Peter, what's the thought of doing it earlier, like maybe in, you know, sometime in October? Because like Unico, we turned around and we wanted to recognize the scholarship winners. And what we did is, because things changed, we moved it to Loretta's Dream instead of the country club, did it outside with social distancing. And there you can have up to 100 people. And we were able to social distance people and do something there. You know, if we do something early October, the weather's still good. And you can have people there and recognize them there and maybe videotape it to show later if we could turn something around that quickly yeah okay some good ideas well i, I agree with judy as well and, and the rest of the groups we probably should just go through the regular process and and identify who they would be you know yeah. another option is you know um i mean maybe things are loosened up in january or february we could move it back um a couple months we don't necessarily have to do it at that time um but at the very minimum, I think we should have some type of an award. And if it's just a, a um, you know, a, a handful of us in the awardees um, in, a, in a ceremony where we could present them, as we said, maybe just something small is fine as well. I mean, special times call for special um, situations. And this might obviously is one. So we'll figure it out. But I, I agree. I think we should go through and still pick out who we think uh, should be. I. I know it's been discussed already, and I'll just bring it up now. Obviously, um, uh, Dan Silver's passing has been a um, an absolute blow uh, to the to to the family and the community. And I think you were mentioning Pete. I mentioned it to you, and I think it was already in discussions that whatever we do, I think we should have some type of recognition, obviously, for Dan at that. And um, maybe uh, it it might be worthy to hold off until the following year to get it more. Um, you know, share it with more people. Just, to, and just thinking out loud, that could be a crappy idea, but um, that's obviously something I know you guys were discussing. Okay. Um, anything else on the salute, Pete? No, that was it. I just wanted to start that conversation. So we will um, uh, pull together uh, the the list of nominees so that we can discuss that in more detail uh, at the next meeting, and uh, and then look at some of the various other options. In the meantime, we'll reach out to the country club and uh, get an understanding of what their limitations are and what they're thinking uh, as well, so. Now this may be another crappy idea, but um, I was talking to Bryce at uh, the Charles about something else. And he said that if, we, if you had it earlier, like somebody suggested, he said that he could accommodate 100 or 150 people outside maybe if you changed it to like a cocktail hour or something, you know, where people can mingle out there. I, it's just a suggestion. Deb, I like you, that. I like that suggestion. Deb, you said it was a crappy, uh, another crappy idea. Are you calling my idea crappy? I just, <laughs> I didn't get hey, it. I would, Mark, I would never disagree with you. <laughs> uh, there's a long line actually, so get in. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, anything's on the table. And if you guys have any other ideas that pop up after the meeting, I mean, shoot them off to Pete or the group. But um, the show must go on. We just don't know how the show will go on, but it must go on. If it has to be in a different form, we'll figure it out. Um, so, um, so just just to add in on that, the requirement is 100 at this point for outside. So even outside. if you can fit 150, this is a town-sponsored event. We're not going to break... We're not going to break the state executive order. There, I, he's I read, changing I read, that, though, right? He's going to be changing that. Uh, looks like September. I know. Yeah, I'm just that's, saying, I was just going to say that. I just read that. But I, I would also say I, I love the Charles idea. I love the country club. As long as we can get the right prices, um, we can also use uh, one of our buildings and do the backyard with the tents, rent the tents, get ascot catering or something like that, we could probably save money and do a cocktail hour or do a little uh, hors d'oeuvres where we're not expending the money and we could, we could maybe save a little bit. Not that I'm, you know, I just think it's a better idea than committing to something that we don't know if we're going to be able to 
pull off. I like the idea of a cocktail hour. I think that that's much uh, more limited in time and energy, and I think people would be more willing to come. And uh, I think we could stick to the 100, just uh, uh, limit the guests. You know, you have to have a ticket. And speaking of tickets, the other thing is that we'd have to really get, you know, legitimate commitments early on and get money up front very early on because obviously this is funded by ticket sales. So if we were gonna do something, we'd have to get people to really commit um, that they're gonna come in light of some people are a little bit more concerned um, at these gatherings than others. Just something to keep in yep. mind from the financial aspect. Okay, anything else on, on Salute to Business? Great, thanks for everybody's input. Um, Mr. Manager? Yes, sir. Would you like to share some wisdom with us, please? I have no wisdom to share. Uh, I'll just kind of go through a, kind of a rundown of some of the things that have been happening. I'll start just by saying, wow, what a great year 2020 has been. Um, <laughs> they, I'm really glad I took this job March 1st, 2019. My life and your lives have never been the same. And, I feel uh, the same way, Gary. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, I think I'm just, I'm cursed. I've, I've brought the curse to the town. Um, so kind of a, I'll do a quick, um, see if I still have it up, overview of COVID, just because I had a meeting right before this with our COVID group. Um, the positive for the town of Wethersfield is our numbers have stayed pretty consistent. We're like 200 and, 276 people confirmed, um, sadly. But I'll also stress only 11 deaths, which means our fatality rate is one of the lowest. Um, it is the lowest in the Central Connecticut Health District um, area, um, but we've we've been able to retain um, a pretty consistent level. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just how many things have been shut down. But it's also the fact that we. Um, our surrounding communities have nursing homes and elder care facilities. So that has driven their numbers upward. Um, parks programming in general, um, they're looking to move to some of uh, either online or social distancing related programming in the fall. They haven't put out a brochure to the general public by now they normally would have. It's gonna be a lot of online applications. This is kind of an opportunity to save some money. Uh, the school system has agreed to go with a hybrid model. Um, so you've got students going back to school, can sit, call it like an A and a B schedule. A schedule is Monday, Tuesday, um, while half of the kids are um, at doing at-home learning. And then they'll swap on Thursday, Friday. The B people will be in the school. The A people will be at home learning. And then Wednesday, everybody's doing at-home uh, or distance learning. Um, the town of Wethersfield has seen 22, or I'm sorry, the state as a whole has a total of 50, just slightly over 50,000, almost 51,000 total COVID-19 cases, up 22 cases total from this time last week, um, 4,400 plus deaths, which are up about six deaths from this time last week, and then hospitaliz hospitalizations are 58 up about 12. So there has been a slight marginal increase. I don't want to speculate what that's due to, but the conversation is, is it due to reopening at some level or um, <clears throat> people commuting? As you know, there is a travel ban in effect for, I think you're probably up to like 41 or 42 states at this point, um, requiring people to quarantine when they return, which is making management just oh so great. Um, Storm power outage, unless you have questions on COVID and I can answer those later. Storm, um, we had a very interesting event over the last seven days. Um, at this point, we are 100% restored in the town of Wethersfield. The state as a whole had more than $700,000, 700,000 total household outages combined, um, Eversource as well as United Illuminating. Um, they are, Eversource is being kind of, um, in a heavy focus from Pure, they're regular to the state's regulatory authority to do an investigation as to why their response was so delayed um, and how they approached it. 
Um, I want to say total in Weathersfield, there were about 9,000 out with 9,000 households out with power, um, which is somewhere around 95% of the town. Um, in three days, you were cut in half. 50% of those had been referred, uh, restored. Um, myself being one of the lucky ones. Um, although I was out for four days, some of you I think were only out for a few minutes. I think Tony had said he was out for six minutes. Um, but there were a lot of people out of power and obviously there were a lot of people anxious over the fact that they didn't have internet for a long period of time coming out because people were working from home and that that is kind of the distraction that um, that they lost. Um, I will say our town's response, my opinion, we were extremely well organized. There are a few things that we have to address, address in terms of um, you know minor just communication issues between across the emergency responders but ultimately uh, I think our EOC people did a great job of handling it, and I think physical services is doing a great job in helping clean up after the storm um, based off of the amount of damage that did take place across town. Uh, we pet I the last I was trying to think the last time I did a report for you guys, so I did include the budget uh, very quickly. The budget did pass in July or in, uh, sorry, end of May, very beginning of June. Um, taxes, mill rates went down 0.05. I want to say the average savings was about $7 a year, but it didn't go up. So, um, you know, we were all a little bit pressed and pressured over the fact that we didn't know what revenues were going to look like um, for this upcoming year. I can say that total revenues were up last year, 320000 um, so that was very helpful as we did. We just, in August, we, um, we, at the end of every year, we look at what our surplus is, we look at where our deficits are, and then we adjust the surplus to cover the deficits and anything left over. We, um, the council has a number of opportunities to use it for. In this case, they did some capital improvement projects, added some capital improvement projects back to the list that was cut. Um, and then they returned between the 320,000 in revenues, the surplus, and um, and some money that's designated in an unfunded budget every year, uh, um, column every year, they return that to what's called the fund balance. Um, just so you're all aware, the, uh, the decision was to take money from the fund balance, which is our emergency fund, to help keep some of our costs in check based off of concern of what our revenues were gonna look like. Council that back to the fund balance with the assumption that next year we're going to have. Um, we've also formed a social, social, we've started to form a social justice coalition. I'm having trouble getting the words out. Uh, the coalition uh, is multifaceted, multi-part. Um, the, has three basic concepts. Well, I'll, I'll back up how we uh, developed the construct on the coalition. Um, the town was working on community conversations to address concerns related to race and um, equality. Um, we began those in 2019. We had to put them on hold for a number of reasons. We began them again, and we were starting to put them together in January, February of 2020. At the same time, the school was dealing with some incidents within um, the school system. And so they had uh, retained a consultant to do some training on implicit bias and work with their staffing on training and education, um, of which Michael Emmett had reached out to me to see if my staff had interest in attending, which of course we decided we would, um, and then COVID hit and shut everything down. So fast forward a couple months, um, we revisited the conversation, but this time rather than just focusing on school administration, or town administration, we decided to work with a consultant to create a broader spectrum or target, um, which would include and allow for residents and business owners to participate at any level they felt. So the design is that there's three components, a steering committee, the coalition itself, and a leadership committee or leadership roundtable. Um, the steering committee, which is made up of myself, Michael Emmett, um, uh, uh, members of uh, diverse members of the school, staff as well as diverse members of town staff and uh, a handful of diverse 
members uh, throughout the community. Their job is mostly to deal with logistics and um, maybe setting up uh, what the scope of work would be. And then they'll help kind of with marketing, outreach, and a schedule to bring the Social Justice Coalition to the forefront. The coalition component is made up of anyone who wants to participate, residents, business owners, um, every age um, from um, adolescent up to adults. We are looking for as much participation as possible. And as part of that, we assume we'll get a lot of participation. Therefore, we'll probably break it up into subcommittees to address you know, specific things that come up in the dialogue. So I kind of can already anticipate there's gonna be one focusing on police. There's gonna be one focusing on specifically on education. There'll be one probably on uh, hiring practices within the town. Just three quick examples. I can't guarantee those will even exist, but that's kind of my sense from what I'm hearing from the community. Um, from those subcommittees, the subcommittees themselves will decide who is the leader of that group and they will form the leadership committee. Those will be the advocates that meet then with the steering committee um, to help drive the change that the community is looking for. Um, so that's kind of the nutshell as quick and condensed as I can. It has many levels and many subject matter uh, conversations related to it, but that's the short and sweet. Um, yeah, other yeah. highlights, fall paving program should, uh, has begun. Um, we're hitting Back Lane, Prospect Street to Whippoorwill Way, Goff Road from Prospect to north of Ciderbrook, and then Coleman from the Silestein Highway up to Longview. Um, hey, Gary. Yes, sir. Can I just grab you for one second? The, the, the committee that you formed, they're all Weathersfield residents, correct? They're all Weathersfield residents, or you could be a business owner if you wish to participate, but they're connected to I'm Weathersfield. The top, the top group. The, 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 the top group, my climate, you know, the, the top group are, um, I believe they're all Weathersfield residents, um, or they have a tie to Weathersfield. So like there's, there's a, there's a doctor that's associated with it that has, I don't know if she's a Weathersfield resident, but she is a, um, but she is a, uh, owns a business, her, her office is in town. All right. Um, or they have a connection. So like, I don't know if Pam Jones, who is a elementary school teacher, um, I don't know if she's a Weathersfield resident, but she's a teacher in town. Doris Duggan, same thing, um, who was a teacher at the high school. I don't right. know if Michael Emmett, you know, uh, Michael Emmett. No, I don't mean that. I mean, yeah, I, I meant the roots are here. I mean, whether they're teachers or, or I just don't want people coming, just joining this group because of, because they're diverse. You know, if we're yeah. going to do it for our town, I think it should be specific. Yeah. I, I, teachers, uh, doctors, all this stuff, no problem. But I yeah. think some of the people, you know. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and we have, and you know, Inc. the um, facilitator uh, Ingrid has has done this in other communities, and her organization has done this in other communities. So we we have a our model is going to be a little bit different, um, but we have a, a kind of a good format to follow. I was on it in Hartford. That's why I know. That's all. Yep. Just, yep. Thank you. Um, Gary, what were the roots? Was this found? Uh, was this? A, a something the town that uh, started or was this the general public wanted this or there's a, a federal mandate state mandate what were the roots of it um the it it got heightened on april 20th 2019 with the police involved shooting of a um, teenager uh, weathersfield teenager uh, there were a lot of calls for conversation um, we felt that we wanted to handle that a certain way before we could bring everyone to the table and actually have an, a discussion. We needed everybody to kind of take a step back and take a breath. So we started with a uh, conversation that focused on trauma and how our bodies deal with trauma and how a community deals with trauma. And then we slowly started talking with different um, groups within town, whether or not they were minority or um, immigrant population um, or felt otherwise marginalized to just talk a little bit about how they feel in town. Do they feel comfortable? Um, what, are their, what are the strengths of the town? What are the weaknesses of the town? Have you ever felt threatened? Um, and it was eye-opening. Um, there were incidents eye-opening in a positive way, right? The, the general impression is people love the town. There's a few things that we need to work on. Um, 
there's other individuals in town who think there's a lot of things that we need to work on. So the idea is why don't we get everybody in the room and talk a little bit about those things and maybe have a discussion. There are some real challenges within the school system. I'm not in the school system, but what I've read in terms of reports and dialogue is that, you know, there's, um, there's some things that everybody needs to be talking about. And that is kind of a, if you think about schools in general, the, the safety of being able to experience life or have conversations, a lot of times starts there. And so I, I think there were conversations or things happening within the school system. Um, so that's why Mike Emmett was approaching it the way he was. And um, it seemed like a nice blend. That being said, every time that there's something related to the police, um, whether it's within the state of Connecticut or in the country, this request for a conversation keeps coming up and it's building. So I think it's probably well timed to have a conversation so that all sides can be heard. Um, and, you know, if there's a need to address something that that will come to the forefront too. And we have to figure out what if what it is and, uh, and address it. So, uh, the, you know, the, that's probably a long answer to your question, but the uh, the impetus is certainly not from the federal government, um, but there, but there is, um, you know, there's enough conversation throughout town that it's something that's raised an eyebrow. Great, thank you, Gary. This is 180 degrees from what we're talking about, but uh, any um, uh, movement on talking with First Church on parking? Yep. And uh, if I can, if I could just come full circle um, on the the. Um, and I'll tie it to EDIC RDA. A lot of what I'm hearing in the community conversation as you talk to a diverse community is are there ways for them, for, for startup businesses or smaller businesses to capture the Weathersfield market or be supported by the Weathersfield residents within there um, and, or tie on to existing things that are going on. So one of the things that came up, this was before of course we nuked um, or made a decision not to hold the, oh God, chamber, um, the corn fest was, you know, there's a number of um, ethnic restaurants or, uh, you know, residents in town who are like, we'd love to have some ethnic food there, kind of diversify the food. So uh, a lot of this dialogue is not as negative as people think it is. A lot of it is eye opening about opportunity um, that ties to development as well. On the parking, and um, again, I don't want to take us too far away. The parking component, um, yep. So we've drafted an MOU that we sent to, we meaning Peter and I worked together, uh, sent over to First Church for review. Um, and they are, uh, they're kind of reviewing it and going through to see, you know, I think we have a very open dialogue with them at this point, And they're very much interested in being a part and supporting the community. So I'm hoping that what we're proposing, they like. Uh, they are in the process of paving their parking lot, which was interesting because one of the things I pitched was some help maintaining it maybe. And he came back, well, really thanks. He didn't say it, but it was like, thanks for nothing. We've already <laughs> done it. Um, but the reality is it'll be wear and tear if we start using it and we want to be considerate of that. Um, for us novices, what is an MOU? Sorry, Memorandum of Understanding. It's basically uh, an, ag an agreement for use. I saw Tom Pentelow, he knew it, he mouthed it. So obviously you're smarter than I am, Pentelow. Got it. Well, that's good news. Um, Cause I think regarding, you know, um, Comstock and, and, um, and the Masonic, uh, I think parking is, has always been an issue. It'd be nice to know that something could happen. I'm, my backyard backs up to the Keeney and I see a lot of people um, um, parking there for the Charles. I think people are getting used to walking um, I mean, which is, which I think is great. Um, so that's good news. Anything else, uh, Mr. Manager? Oh, there's so much, but that's probably enough. All right. Hey, uh, hey I'm Mark. Just, it's, it's Thompson. Just a, a quick broader point for the group. I, I've been getting calls a lot, um, from some of those groups that, uh, are, are working on, um, the social justice and, and the things that, uh, Gary was just working through. Um, What's interesting is just something to think about from a development perspective and broader going forward. Um, with this pandemic, almost every element that's been viewed as progressive and something that people want more of 
more public transportation, more um, mobility of citizens between towns, specifically like Hartford and the, the surrounding community and more engagement, denser housing are all counter to success in keeping the pandemic under control. So it's been interesting trying to mix up, you know, help these groups with social justice, social determinants of health, economics, and the realities of the world. Yeah, I, I have one of my client spreadsheets open here. Wethersfield did great to the earlier comment that uh, Gary, Gary had made. My, my stat's a little older, it's probably a week out of date, but we've had 10.5 COVID cases per, um, per thousand people here in Wethersfield. But Hartford, which is like a mile away, right, has had over double that. That's, that's amazing that in that geography, and then none of the towns surrounding Hartford other than Windsor have high rates of, of COVID. So that basically says there's very little mixing between people in, in Hartford and those surrounding communities. So it's just, it's just something to think about in the future, how you reconcile all of this. Or Tom, that to population may be more immune suppressed. Yeah, I know there's a million things in there. Like I, you know, Gary had mentioned earlier that the nursing home problem, I mean, the, the uh, Rocky Hills numbers are just horrendous because of it. But I think Hartford does have a higher rate of uh, predisposition to the virus. Yep. Actually, it has a higher rate of, of socioeconomic factors that come Correct. the condition. Yep. Yep. Correct. Right. Exactly. Yep. yep. Um, one last thing then, Gary, you mentioned that, you know, that you were surprised that the, that at those meetings they were talking the social justice group that there was EDI things that could pertain to EDIC and RDA. Should we be at at that meeting? Um, should we be there at, in an official role or? Well, so so two different parts. So the social justice coalition, this new idea hasn't rolled out yet. Those were the community conversations. Let's call those the precursors to it. That's what was happening in 2019. Um, I would say that to take the individuals who were there and maybe engage them in that conversation would be a separate thing for the EDIC. I'd love to have people on this list participate, you know, and you'll all be invited to participate in the Social Justice Coalition. My, it's a, it's a, a multi-year, so my prediction is the first few meetings are probably going to be rough um, because people want to get a lot of emotion off their chest on things um, on both sides of the concern, um, you know, because of what's going on right now in the country as a whole, um, and even in the state, the split and uh, focus on police, um, you know, accountability and personal accountability. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of that has to get out of the way, but ultimately I think the town, you know, I'll use New Britain and Norwich as an example. When you start to embrace diversity, things like economic and tie it to economic development, you can actually measure the change of business startups of, um, you know, new restaurants, new um, retail, although some of that stuff has been nuked by, uh, by COVID, um, but some of the uniqueness of your community starts to come out as you start to embrace diversity. Not to say that we haven't embraced diversity, I'm just saying some of these individuals, no way they would come forward on their own. It took myself, and at the time it was Mayor Amy Morimbello, um, and like Erica Texera and Kim Bobbin to go to them and hear the ideas and say, why haven't you bothered bringing that to someone's attention? Well, I didn't know who to talk to about it. Um, those are the things that you, you know, you just as a cue, you, you latch on to and say, well, when X, Y, Z happens, we're going to bring you forward and say, okay, you know, let, let's, let's start small. Corn Fest is a great opportunity. It's going to cost you X to rent the booth. You got to get your safe serve permit. You got to get all this stuff in place, but that's your introduction to the community. So I always look for those opportunities, and I absolutely think if there's a way I can blend it in with the EDIC, I'll drag them to the table, drag you or them to the table. Yeah, please, uh, please do. Anything else to report, sir? Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. can, I, can I just mention one thing? And I know we're not supposed to be on that topic very much longer, but I've been getting calls about the um, holiday on Maine. Um, not only are we going to be having it, but that it's not. Um, it doesn't focus on diversity. They, I've been getting calls saying that it's, 
it's Christian based and so I'm getting complaints about that. So I just, just to echo what Gary's saying, you know, so that is what's you have, going on. You have a Jewish town manager and people looked at me cross-eyed <laughs> when I said, so where are we putting up the menorah? And the, Gary, I, I have a committee for you. The, uh, I'm happy to be <laughs> on it. The, uh, and we put, one, we put one up in the fires, fire station. Uh, it wasn't very big because I didn't have a lot of time to do it. Did I lose you? Right no, now. I think that's awesome. Thank you. I would, thank you. Um, Deb, I think it would be an amazing idea if any of these people that are coming forward that are, don't feel they're being represented, and I clearly understand that, if there was an area from an educational perspective where they could develop something at that holidays on Maine, where people can be educated on different um, um, events and different celebrations under different religions. I think that would be great. And I, I've always, uh, when people have come to me on other things to go, you know, I really think we should have it. I like to go directly back to that individual and say, what would you like to do? Um, mm -hmm. How would you like to help? Um, and that either gives them an audience to say, wow, thank you. Or maybe they rethink it and try to bring in somebody else, but definitely reach out and extend. I think that's a mature event, but I think from an educational perspective, it would be phenomenal. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I, I definitely took names and numbers. Yeah, I was just also going to add that, like, you know, at the school system level, for those of us who still have kids that are going through the school system, especially at the elementary school level, you know, everything's changed and it's been changed for years. So it used to be a Christmas concert years ago, right? So now it is a complete, I mean, it's a multi-religion event, right? And that's the way it really it should be. And I think you could learn a lot probably from what the school system plans and has to do um, and maybe relate some of that to potentially holidays on Maine. And, you know, I, I never looked at it from that perspective, obviously, but it's, it's definitely, it's out there. Uh, but they do a good job. I mean, again, we get to learn about, you know, everyone's religion and that's fine. It's fine by me. Great. Um, council? Patrick, are you here? No, he's not here. Okay. Um, anybody have anything to add or to that particular line item from town council? Any data? Anything going on? Okay. I'm trying to think. Um, I talked about the budget. I talked about the, they just reallocated funds. Uh, we're, okay. you know, we're slow this time of year because it's the, uh, it's a break. There's only one council meeting a month. Got it. Um, yeah. Our friend Dan Silver is not here to report on planning and zoning. Um, the only um, other thing that is in any way controversial is um, we have an application pending uh, to let the um, contractor who's doing the water uh, and sewer work on Church Street uh, use the parking lot for um, uh, at the back side of the auction gallery. So the neighbors on the other side of the tracks are not. Uh, real keen on that idea. So that hearing is continued uh, until the Tuesday night planning and zoning commission meeting. You may have seen them already working out there with a bunch of equipment already, uh, but um, it's generated a lot of controversy with the neighbors uh, on the on the other side. The same neighbors that are about the dog park too, right? Yes, the same uh, neighborhood, yes. But it is temporary. It is temporary, yes. Okay. Judy, Heritage Tourism? Um, I have nothing, if we've not had a meeting, but I would say that the Web Dean Stevens is now uh, conducting tours and the building continues to move along. Um, and, uh, you know, I see a lot of people in Old Weathersfield. So I, I think that uh, despite COVID, I think Old Weathersfield is doing okay. So that's my report. Thank you, Judy. Um, Ms. Raymond? Oh, sorry, yes. So I think I spilled everything I had. Um, I continue to try and visit all the chamber business members and you know keep my ear to the ground for that. And again, that's what I brought today to think that we should have a town meeting somehow with the business mem members. 
to uh, just gather before we all get locked down in the winter months. But we already discussed that, so. Got it. Deb, uh, this is a, a completely uh, outside of the, uh, of, of the topic. I was talking with a, um, a very good friend of mine who lives out on the West Coast and who's involved with fundraising and economic development out there. And, and he's in the San Francisco area. And they're, obviously they have the same issues that we have. And they were talking about some of the events that they used to do that they're no longer doing. And, and I had mentioned the Corn Fest was something that we had been doing for a long time. But I think that's that I think you said we retired the corn fest and no um, we retired it this year um, and yeah I mean that's a whole hot topic right now so we retired it this year because the um, attendance was down um, Leslie could probably address that a little more I don't want to put you on the spot okay no she doesn't want I wasn't at those meetings to be honest but um, I, you know, I've been trying to throw out some, some new ideas for that because I do think it's a, I do think it's an event in town we should have. Maybe it has to be revised and revamped a little bit. Um, the, the problem with the Corn Fest also is lack of volunteers. It's a huge endeavor and, you know, the people, quite honestly, the people that were heavily involved in organizing that are getting older now and they're they've done it for years and it, especially Leslie you know I mean but you know it, it, that's been part of the from what I understand I wasn't at that meeting so but yeah I would we would love to get that going again hey Deborah you know hey, Mark yes. I gotta take off see you guys thank you Tom thanks Tom, thanks, Tom. See you guys. hey Deborah one thing there is there is just I don't know it's just my neighborhood, but houses are flying off the market with new people moving into town. It might be it might be a great time to engage some of the, the newbies, relaunch the event, and and get them involved. Now they might be busy painting their new houses and making their living rooms look nice, but um, there's some new folks that might be willing to jump in. I, I do think that the um, corn fest became very expensive for families. There's an admission fee and then the rides or, you know, the bouncy houses and all that was getting so expensive. I, I almost think it would be good to go back to our roots and do, you know, the uh, contest for the best pumpkin, the contest for, you know, make it more like an agricultural fair and um, recognize people in the community, may, uh, maybe kids, get the troops the so boy scouts girl scouts so it's ironic that you said that because i just submitted something on that uh put together something on getting it back to you know the old flavor of old weathersfield and maybe even getting the historical society involved and in helping that out you know doing some of the yep. old games yep. having them go you know having some of the people walk around in the costumes um you know we're in direct competition with uh major fairs at that time like the berlin fair which has, you know, a lot more to offer for the money. Like Judy, like you said, Judy, it became very expensive for families. But, yep. it's, you know, it was expensive to put it on as well. And we only had last year, I think, which wasn't a lot, like a, a less than 3,000 attendees, which wasn't a lot. Um, well, that's one of the things that people always say about our carnival is, thank goodness there's no admission fee and uh like the big e you have to pay to park you have to pay to get in then you have to pay for the rides too so yeah you know what judy the problem is is that that's where we made most of our money but um maybe there should be an increase in the vendors you know what what they because we don't charge a lot for the vendors that go in there in my opinion because i've been doing some investigating on that but um it's um it, i'm kind of bringing it to the forefront again because i do think it's something important but i'm I, yeah yeah. One of the things Deb been talking, um, this may not be a substitute for the Corn Fest, but maybe just another potential idea is um, is inviting um, food trucks. You talk about diversity for food. If you were able yeah. to set up a situation where you got 10 or 15 food trucks out there along with some entertainment uh, and whatnot, it, now 
it, again, it doesn't really take into the flavor of all weathers fields. So I don't think it would be a replacement for the corn fest, but people love to, people love to eat and they love entertainment. And if there's a way that you could, um, and it's very inexpensive and probably easy to manage if the food trucks are coming in and they're manning their own people and all you really have to deal with is, you know, trash and maybe tables and whatnot, but there could be a way where you can charge the, the trucks X amount of dollars to be there, or they give a certain percentage of their revenue back to, um, to the chamber. Um, but Mark, Mark uh, where do you, where do you, I've thought about that as well. And where, where would you see that happening in town? Well, I mean, I, I, I other than the potential damage to the tree roots on the Wethersfield Green, I can see the trucks literally being along both sides of the, of the green. Um, now, again, you'd have to speak with, there have always been issues on compression of the roots on equipment um, in that area, but um, that's, you know, that's a possibility. Um, um, so, and if it was focused around food and entertainment, I think people would probably come out in droves, um, but that's just a, one man's humble two cents, um, and it, it could be. Uh, I like that idea. Yeah. So, um, and and I food trucks are easy to contract and tell them, and they're easy to come and they set up and they leave and there's not because I know what the amount of setup that you guys have got to do just on getting the corn fest just set up is huge. Um, so anyway, just an idea. Um, um, Chamber of Commerce uh, report, um, you're, have you concluded, Ms. Raymond? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, I do have something, it's not so much a report. Um, um, Paul, are you still online? I'm here. Great. Uh, this will be, you'll be helpful on this. I, you, I've been saying this with a little bit of um, levity uh, to Mr. Gillespie over the last few months, and I, I'm, maybe you can help me. Being in Old Wethersfield, and that's beginning to burgeon and whatnot, I question the um, the horn uh, that comes on at noon and the horn that they used when there's a fire. And I wanted to know if that's something that is still an important aspect to the fire department. Um, I know the horn when I was a kid is before cell phones and beepers and anything else, you heard the horn and that if you lived in town, you knew to go to the firehouse to go put out a fire. Is that still part, is that still an important aspect because if you sit next to the Charles or anywhere in that area and that horn goes off, that B and B in that area, I mean, it gives you a heart attack. I know if it's functional, then I completely get it. But I'm would be happy to hear your your take on that. I'm I'm a little I'm a little rusty on on the facts here because I've I haven't talked about it in a long long time. But the 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 nuts and bolts of it are there is a requirement and I don't recall whether it's like federal, national, fire code, whatever, that there be two forms of notification to the firemen. So they all carry their pagers, which the dispatcher tones us out, or when I was in, toned, up, toned everybody out. But then the um, horns function as a backup. And they are also air horns. They're not electronic. So in the event that there's no power, they can still be sounded and they can be sounded manually. So, so they, do, they do have a function. And I will tell you, when I was in, I can't tell you how many times I was out snow blowing the driveway, working in the yard, didn't have the pager and the horn went off. I'm like, oh shit, I got a fire. So a absolutely, they, they do form a, a function and a, and a purpose. Um, you know, if generally the rule was they don't sound the horn after 6 p.m. Um, unless it's a working structure fire or confirmed um, issue. And, and it's controllable, it's not automatic. The dispatcher can, I, I believe, not sound the horn if, if they wanna hold back on it. Is there a reason that it still goes off at noon? Test. Oh, test, okay. The, the, the fire, you know, the, the fire service is, is the, the fire service relies on redundancy and relies on, um, simplicity like the air horn versus electronic so it it does form a function and and having it hearing it every day at noon you know it's working you know every fireman in town knows that the horns are functional that day thanks for that got it so if if it's two forms are, do they still hand out pagers to all firefighters as well as um i mean is that standard equipment issue and the fire department is pager still? 
Yeah, pager is the standard. Pager is one method and the horn is the backup. Okay. Would cell phones be viewed as a potential secondary form of information or of, uh, of alert? You'd have to explore that one with, with Anthony and uh, Rich Bailey and, and those guys. Okay. Good. Well, I'm glad good? you're on the call. Glad you're on the call. Um, Gary, we were discussing the town, uh, the horn at the fire, de at the fire department, uh, the fire station on Weathersfield and uh, the importance of it. Uh, or, or the non-importance of it. I don't, I'm purely from a business perspective, um, it, it scares people when it goes off. Um, uh, and if it's something that is critical and important to keeping the town safe, then obviously this is a non-starter. But if it's one of those things that, um, you know, Paul was, gave us some insight that we needed two forms of um, communication and back in the day, it was a pager, which I know everybody is still issued. And the horn was a secondary event. Um, which, so again, I just pose it that if it's not needed and the fire department thinks it's not needed, then maybe it would be something that would make Old Weathersfield and that district a little bit more, um, less prone to heart attacks. Um, uh, or if it is necessary, then it's a dead horse and is nothing to beat. But I just, I'm, I've been curious about it, that's all. Because I've been down there at the Charles when it's gone off, and um, the drinks are expensive there, and I dropped my drink, and it cost me nine fifty. Um, so, uh, so hey Mark, here's, yes, here's, here's a way that we could maybe achieve it then, um, and really go back in old Weathersfield's history. Um, before horns and pagers, way back in the colonial days, a kid used to run down the street with ringing a bell, <laughs> screaming that there was a fire. Now, given your house's location. They could page you, and you could come running out the house in Old Weathersfield and run down Main Street with the bell. I've been trying to work on my cardio, so this is an opportunity, I think. Thank you for that, Paul. You can put yourself on mute now if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, but you have to stay in town and not go off on business meetings, Mark. Exactly. Yeah. Um, thank you for the color commentary, Mr. Thompson. Um, <laughs> marketing and communication. Anything, Pete? I know we do want to get a um, yep. A date. We want to get a meeting set up. Yep. Do you want to get a calendar out now? And sure. I was thinking the uh, first week of September after after Labor Day, maybe the the Wednesday or the Thursday. Um, the seventh on, I am gone for a week of September. Is that the week you're talking about, or the week? Week before. Oh, the, oh, the second on. Yeah. So the first. Um, uh, I could make. Um, what day is Labor Day? What day do we celebrate Labor Day? Monday the before? The 7th. The 7th. Right. So you're talking the week of the first, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I can make a early meeting any of those days. You want to say, day? uh, want to say Wednesday morning? Sure. 8.30? Did 8.30 work? Sure. Okay, and will that meeting. be a, that's a Zoom? Yes. Okay, Wednesday, September 2nd at 8 30. Yep. Great. The only other the only other thing I wanted to mention is I, I sent out an email uh, to everybody uh, last week, I think it was on um, Next um, Wednesday at five o'clock, there's a training uh, opportunity on complete streets, uh, biking and walking and those kinds of things. The Central Connecticut Health District is coordinating amongst the four uh, member towns uh, and offering uh, that. So if anybody wants to uh, join us, it'll be a Zoom meeting as well at five o'clock in the uh, afternoon. Uh, if you're interested, uh, let me know and I'll make sure you get the invite from the consultant. What's the uh, EDIC RDA angle there, Pete? I think it means uh, biking and walking also promote economic development okay. and encourage visitors, that kind of thing. So uh, a couple of people from the Tourism Commission will probably be joining us, but there's certainly an economic development uh, angle to uh, increasing uh, that kind of activity here, particularly in Weathersfield. Got it. All right. 
Sounds like a, uh, sounds like a, an interesting meeting. I'll try to make that, Pete. Um, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for Thursday, September 10th. Uh, any correspondence, Peter? Sorry, no. Rats. Um, then I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I'll make it. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Um, stay safe. Wear your mask. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.